I can see the promised land. Though there's pain within the plan, there is victory in the end. Your love is my battle cry. With my fears like Jericho, build their walls around my soul. When my heart is overflow, your love is my battle cry. The anthem for all my life. Every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past. You've broken into over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible with you. There is hope within the fight, in the wars that rage inside. Though the shadows steal the light, your love is my battle cry. The anthem for all my life, every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past. You've broken it to over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. Every giant will fall. The mountains will move. Every chain of the past. You've broken it to over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. Oh, nothing is impossible. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us this morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I think this is the second Sunday in the month. I have a public service announcement that I need to make. I, I don't like to start with something negative. I don't like to really get preachy to begin with, but I kind of feel like we need to start here. If your Christmas decorations are still up, you are in violation. <laughs> Next week, they need to be down. Our shepherds and staff will be driving around the county <laughs> to check. So please get them down because it's Valentine's Day now. <laughs> and I actually saw the Easter Bunny this week. So things are moving fast. Let's, let's get things in the right order. Hey, if you're a guest, I hope, you, hope it's pretty obvious that we don't get too uptight here. We kind of like to have a good time, but we also want to worship God and, and encourage each other. So we're really, really glad that you're here. If, if you're here because, you know what, I made a New Year's resolution, I'm going to go to church, good for you. Thanks for coming out to be with us. We've made some New Year's resolutions too, and if we work together, we can do this. So we're really glad that you've uh, joined us this morning. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out if you have a prayer request. Let me just urge you to, to write that down, and you can put down anything you want. It can be public, and we'll tell everybody about it, or it can be private. We'll keep it that way, and we'll pray over it uh, just amongst our leadership. So we're really looking forward to praying over those things that you write down this week. Um, let's uh, stand. We're going to begin our worship, and we're going to be singing and praying and talking about our faithful, faithful God, which is something we need going into this new year. So glad you're here. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever.
His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with
we share from Psalm 65. Praise awaits you, our God in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who still the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it with budget. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have your name. You've drenched its furrows and leveled its ridges. You soften it with the showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty, and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. Be seated as we take her off. Promise maker, promise keeper, you finish what you begin. Our provision through the desert, you see it through till the Seated on the throne of heaven, glory. 
the King that gave us life with every drop of blood. Jesus, the Lamb of God, Savior and King, you alone are worthy of our praise forever, you seated on the throne of heaven, glorified, glorified, you alone, you alone, are worthy of our praise forever, you alone, are seated on the throne of heaven, glorified, glorified. In a few minutes, Jody is going to be sharing the amazing story of the exodus of the Israelite people from the land of Egypt. He'll give a lot more backstory and details, but for now, suffice it to say that the Lord was bringing judgment upon Egypt in the form of a series of plagues with the intent of humbling its leader, Pharaoh, so that he would set Israel free from slavery. After Pharaoh repeatedly refuses to respond, the Lord declares one final plague, that every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh himself down to that of the lowest slave and prisoner, and even those among the cattle. It will be a night of death. Before that night comes, however, the Lord gives some special and very strange instructions to the people of Israel. Each household is to come together and kill their best lamb and roast it for a meal with flatbread and bitter herbs. And they are to eat this meal quickly and being properly dressed for a long journey uh, and, and ready to leave at a moment's notice. The Lord calls this meal the Lord's Passover because although he will pass through Egypt and bring death to them, he will pass over the Israelites, and that plague of death will not come into their households. So as the Israelites are eating that very first Passover meal, they are not celebrating events that have already happened. Instead, they are waiting in eager anticipation with staff in hand and bags packed for the Lord's promise of freedom from slavery. And the Lord did deliver that. And so now we also gather around the Lord's table. And unlike those Israelites, we do have something incredible to celebrate that has already occurred. The death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to free us from the bondage of sin and death. But just like those Israelites, our story is not yet complete as we eat this meal. The Apostle Paul said of this meal, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes, there are still promises of God which remain for us. So as we eat this bread, let us consider, are we living in eager anticipation of his return, even in the midst of pain and hardship and death, ready for this journey, expecting God to be faithful to deliver us into his promised land? Join me in prayer. Lord, as David invites us in Psalms to taste and see how good you are, may our trust in your faithfulness to fulfill all your promises be so very real to us that we can taste it in this bread this morning, representing the body of our Savior who rose from the dead, testifying that you have full power over life and death, and we can entrust all we are and all we have to you. Through Jesus I pray.
There was another important aspect to the Lord's Passover in addition to the meal. The Israelites were also to take some of the blood from the lamb they had killed for that meal and put it outside on the doorposts of their homes. And the Lord said when he saw this blood, he would pass over that house. And at this point, I think it is reasonable to ask, wouldn't God already know which households were his servants without having to see a visible sign outside? But as we look closely at the Lord's instructions to them in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13, he says, the blood on the doorpost shall be a sign for you, a sign for the Israelites, a sign of public defiance that they did not worship the Egyptian gods, but rather Jehovah, a sign of assurance of God's protection from the death which would sweep through the land that night, a sign to them of God's deliverance in rescuing them from their oppressors, and a sign to them of God's grace at being chosen from among all peoples to bring light into a very, very dark world. In short, a sign to them forevermore of God's faithfulness. And it is his faithfulness during that night and the broader events of the Exodus which are memorialized in the Jewish feast of Passover. And his faithfulness has been celebrated from that year forward. Many centuries later, one of the descendants from these Israelites, Jesus, would transform that meal into what we are sharing now. And instead of the Israelites killing their best lamb every year, once a year, God offered the best he had, his son, the perfect lamb of God, as a sacrifice once and for all time on our behalf. And the one thing that mattered most on that Passover night was whether or not the blood was on the doorpost of each household. And so the question remains for us, do we have the blood of Jesus on the doorpost of our life? Are we submitting to his lordship with full assurance that his blood is assigned to us of God's protection and deliverance and grace and his faithfulness? Let's pray again. Lord, just as the lamb's blood was the barrier which separated your people from death during that Passover night, we drink this cup now proclaiming that the blood of Jesus is the only reality which can separate us from eternal death. And we proclaim with full confidence that you will come again to receive us into all your promises. Through Christ I pray. Amen.
I can't remember a trial or a pain. He did not recycle to bring me gain. I can't remember one single regret in serving God only and trusting. A couple of things I want to share with you before we get started this morning. One of our older members, Maddie Foster, has been in an assisted living facility for some time now. We received word this weekend from Billy, her husband, that uh, they are calling in hospice uh, to be with her now. Uh, so keep Billy and Maddie Foster in your prayers, sweet folks, and uh, they need our care right now. Speaking of care, um, we are beginning a new ministry um, on Wednesday nights. Uh, it's called a care and coping class for family members who have people in their family that are struggling with addiction. Uh, Stephen and Ann Clark are going to be leading that class. They'll meet down in the Mercy Building. That's the building right down here um, on our campus right next to Bird Spring Road. And that'll begin at 6.30 on Wednesday nights. Call our church office if you have uh, questions about that or want to know about it. It'll be on Wednesday nights. It'll be a great um, support group for folks that are struggling with somebody in their family who is fighting an addiction. 
And then uh, another, on another note, our Jobs for Life program, uh, J- we call it JFL, but that stands for Jobs for Life, is going to be beginning in a couple of weeks, two weeks away. And that's a program where we work with folks that uh, are either in between jobs or have had a hard time finding a job because of uh, just for a variety of different kinds of issues. We take a Christian approach to it, and we have folks that really try to help them hone their skills for interviews and help them find positions all framed up within a very uh, Christian worldview. Right now, we need champions to walk alongside these folks and just be an encouragement to them. Uh, So if you can uh, be a part of that, uh, Dan Barney is a good guy to get a hold of. Dan, can you just kind of wave your hand? He's right over here. Really, Dan is sitting next to a handsome guy, but Dan is not. So you just got to talk to Dan. Dan can help you with that. It's a great ministry. It's a really good program. And then uh, there's one other uh, sort of uh, program note that I want to make. Uh, Mike, do we have that, uh, that photo? Can we put that up? Oh, here we go. That is not our, our newest grandson. That is, is, is Jet Darby, and that's what I did last Sunday morning after I got finished in here. I went over there, and you guys finished out the service here, and I, I walked around with Jet. Here's a really cool thing that I realized is, is that the, the, the male arm is perfect for holding a baby. We think that, you know, that's kind of like a lot of guys think that's the women are supposed to do that. I had more fun than you did, I guarantee you. He was awesome. All we had to do was walk around. You ever smelled a baby? I mean, the, the head? <laughs> it's really precious. And the cool thing about Jet is he timed his need for a diaper change to the point when his mother showed up at the door. So when? It's all the way. I would, I would love to do that more often. I'm probably, this is where I think the shepherds want me to be, but if I need to be in there, I'll be in there. So if I'm not here one Sunday, it's because somebody didn't volunteer to help in the nursery. A word to the sufficient is wise. So, all right. So uh, here we are. Um, let me give you a quick catch up on what's been going on. We've committed to read the scriptures together this year. Uh, we're calling it In the Word in 2018. And we're re- we really want to just dive into the scripture and stay there all year long and read from the, the Garden of Eden in Genesis all the way to the city of God in Revelation. Just read it all and really get into the Word and let the Word get into us. And we've started that with a, with a, a, a tool called the Bible Project. You can go to our website, twickenham.org and scroll down to around the middle of the page there, and you'll find a link to that, um, that reading plan. And you can click on that. You can download it on your device. You can follow it through our website. Uh, you can print it out and if, you're, if you like a hard copy and, and read it that way. But we're really trying to get everybody to commit to sharing in the Word. Then on Wednesday nights, we are getting together uh, at 6.30 in the main uh, fellowship hall downstairs just to talk about what we have read that week. Now, you may be thinking, oh, it's already too late. It's the seventh. I'm already behind. Pick up with the reading wherever it is and just follow along with us. I'm going to be blogging about those, uh, the things that we read through the week, uh, each week, and we just got a lot of resources for you that you can tap into. So what I wanted to do this morning was sort of catch you up to where we are and go a little bit ahead uh, with our reading plan to give you an idea about what's going on in the scriptures. The, very, the first 11 chapters of Genesis introduce us to the good world that God created. And then they describe the fatal choice and a downward spiral into chaos, violence, and death. If, you, if you've joined us in this plan to be in the Word in 2018, you've been reading about that uh, this first week in, in, in January. Genesis 12 introduces us to a man named Abram or Abraham, and out of all the people on the planet, God selects Abram and his wife Sarai or Sarah 
to launch his plan to rescue humanity from the consequences of our choices, God tells Abraham that through him, all nations of the, on, the, on the earth will be blessed, and the rest of the Bible, believe it or not, follows the story of this one family. Despite their advanced age, Abraham and Sarah do have a son. His name is Isaac. Isaac has two sons. Their names are Esau and Jacob. And Jacob, who is renamed Israel, which is where we get the idea of Israel, the, the, the nation, Jacob has 12 sons, and the most famous of Jacob's sons is Joseph of Technicolor Dreamcoat fame. Lisa and I saw the Osmonds in that play at the Fox Theater in Atlanta a few years ago. It was absolutely fabulous. The family of Israel is as dysfunctional a bunch as you will ever see. Jealousy, arrogance, insecurity, turbocharged sibling rivalry result in Joseph being sold into slavery by his own brothers and winding up in Egypt. But while his brothers wanted only to rid themselves of Joseph, God had other plans. Joseph rises to power in Egypt. Years later, driven to Egypt by a famine, the brothers reunite. I'm a little bit of ahead of our reading here, but that's, that's Genesis. This morning... I want to give you a coming attraction, not just for our reading plan. It's a coming attraction for our lives. So, Joseph and his brothers and their families settle in a place called Goshen, which is south of Egypt, where they live in peace and prosperity. They've survived one of the worst famines of the ancient world. They've overcome this really nasty family history, this rift that split their family. They've overcome that. They're finally together, finally safe. In time, one by one, Joseph and his brothers, as the Bible likes to put it, are gathered to their fathers. They die in peace. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, which is about a week and a half or so ahead of us here, the story takes a dark turn. A new king to whom Joseph meant nothing comes to power in Egypt. And this king has no awareness or appreciation for history. He's threatened by this growing Israelite demographic, so he enslaved them, oppressing them into forced servitude. Um, He made their lives bitter uh, with hard labor. Uh, He turned them all into brick masons, building his cities and his pyramids. Pharaoh even ordered their midwives, the the women who helped Israelite women deliver babies, ordered them to kill any newborn Hebrew boys. When they disobeyed, then Pharaoh ordered all of his people to capture Israelite baby boys and throw them into the Nile River. For the next 80 years, the Israelites were oppressed, abused, and enslaved. They groaned in their slavery and cried out for help, and then... Look who showed up. Exodus chapter 2. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And so God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Miles and miles away from from the hard labor camp of Egypt on the far side of the land of Midian, an 80 year old man with secrets to hide was tending the sheep of his father-in-law. The man saw smoke rising over the ridge of a hill, and he went to investigate. When he topped the hill, he saw a bush on fire, but not burning up. Curious, he drew closer, and then look who showed up. Exodus chapter 3, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, he called out to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you were standing is holy ground. And then he said, I'm the Lord, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. God gave Moses a mission. He was to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. But Moses argued with God, which is what a thing human beings are wont to do whenever God gives us a mission. Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and, and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, you're the man I am with. That's who you are. And Moses asked, well, what if they ask me your name? And I don't know it. And God said, you tell them that my name is I am who I am. 
that I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I'm the God who has seen what has happened to you, the God who has promised to bring you up out of your misery. And Moses objected, well, what if they don't believe me? God said, what's that in your hand, Moses? And Moses looked down at the object in his hand, and he said, it's a staff. And God said, Moses, you should probably throw that down right now. And Moses threw the staff down, but before it hit the ground, it was no longer a wooden staff. It was a wiggling snake. And lo, Moses ran. God said, pick up the snake by the tail, Moses. And Moses said, what? But he picked it up, and it became a staff again. God said, put your hand inside your cloak, Moses. And Moses put his hand inside his cloak. God said, take it out, which if it had been me, I would have hesitated right here with the memory of the snake so fresh in my mind. But Moses pulled his hand out and it was covered with leprosy. God said, put it back. He did. When he pulled it out the next time, his hand was whole and healthy. God said, there you go. After a little more arguing about what a poor public speaker he was, and I've always found it interesting that Moses was as eloquent a speaker as you'll find in the Bible when it came to arguing about his ineloquence. But he finally decided to obey God. He went to, he went to Egypt, and on the way, his brother Aaron met him. They brought together the elders of Israel and told them the whole wild story about the bush that wouldn't burn up and about this message from God. And to tell the truth, they figured that the elders of Israel would think that these two crazy guys were a couple of trees shy of a full oasis. Then look who showed up. Exodus chapter 4 verse 30 says that the Lord enabled Moses to perform the miracles before the people and they believed. So Moses and Aaron went to see Pharaoh. They said, the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. But Pharaoh was disinclined. The truth is he was angry. He told his slave drivers to work the people even harder, to stop giving them the materials they needed to make the bricks but to make them gather their own materials and yet meet the same daily quotas. And when the Israelite union reps went to meet with Pharaoh to complain, he said, you're a bunch of lazy bums, get back to work. So they found Moses in there and said, you see what you've done? Pharaoh is trying to kill us and it's your fault. Moses had a mutiny on his hands. Pharaoh wasn't budging. The people were rebelling. Moses was failing. Everything that Moses had warned God about was happening just as he said. Then look who showed up. God said, Moses, I want you to go back to Pharaoh. I want you to tell him, let my people go. Now I'm going to tell you up front that he's not going to do it. So I'm going to unleash a torrent of plagues on Egypt, the likes of which no one has ever seen. They'll be talking about this thousands of years from now. They'll make movies about it. And so it was. The Nile turned to blood, but Pharaoh didn't budge. The frogs crawled up out of the river and filled the houses, but Pharaoh wouldn't budge. Gnats swarmed the land. The livestock died. Boils broke out on the Egyptians. Hail rained down on their crops. Locusts stripped the trees. Darkness descended on the land. And God gave Pharaoh one last chance, but Pharaoh wouldn't budge. So Stuart talked about earlier, just as Pharaoh had deprived Israel of its sons, God deprived Egypt of hers. God killed every firstborn son in every Egyptian family. Because sometimes when God shows up, it's not to deliver, it's to judge. And finally, Pharaoh budged. He let God's people go. They held a grand liberation celebration. And when it was over, they packed their things and marched. By day, God led them with a column of clouds, and at night, he led them by a pillar of, a pillar of fire. God led them every step of the way, right up to the edge of the Red Sea, and there they camped along the shore, free for the first time in 400 years, just as God had promised Abraham back in Genesis 15. <clears throat> I don't know who saw it first, a, a lookout maybe, a young couple taking a walk in the evening, some kids playing along the outskirts of the camp, but somebody looked up and saw a cloud of dust moving toward them, the Egyptian army in all its resplendent anger. Pharaoh had apparently realized the economic impact of losing his slave workforce, and he had changed his mind. Didn't take a military genius to recognize 
the insecurity of the Israelite position. Water in front, a sea in fact, desert on the left and right flanks, and the Egyptians approaching from the, from the rear. They were easy targets in a cul-de-sac of vulnerability. By now, though, I think Moses was beginning to learn that God shows up when things look bad. And so in Exodus chapter 14, he says, don't be afraid, stand firm, and, and you'll see the deliverance of the Lord that he will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And then look who shows up. I love this next part. It's Exodus chapter 14, verse 15, if you want to take a look at it. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move. Raise your staff, stretch your hand out over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through on dry ground. Moses did, the sea parted, and Israel crossed. When Pharaoh and his army tried to follow, the walls of water collapsed, the Egyptians were destroyed, and Israel was saved. When God's people were oppressed, enslaved, forced into bitter labor, God showed up. When Moses was wasting his gifts in the Midian wilderness, God showed up. When Pharaoh refused to believe or to budge, God showed up. When the Egyptians increased the animosity of their oppression, God showed up. When the Israelites were trapped between the sea, the desert, and the wrath of Pharaoh, God showed up. Every time... Events in that story reached a critical moment. God showed up. And that's not just the story of the Exodus. That's the story of the Bible. When Adam and Eve let sin off its chain in the garden, God showed up. When Abraham thought the promise had passed its expiration date, God showed up. When Joseph wound up in an Egyptian Shawshank, God showed up. When David looked up at a nine-foot-tall gladiator named Goliath, God showed up. When Daniel looked down into a den of lions, God showed up. When an old man named Simeon thought he would die before he saw the Messiah, God showed up. When Peter thought his failure was final, God showed up. When Paul thought his logic was flawless, God showed up. When you and I were powerless, still sinners, at just the right time, God showed up. As, as we go deeper into the Word in 2018, we'll see this scenario play out again and again and again and again. But it's not just something that used to happen back in the Bible. God still shows up. He may not come when we want him to or how we expect. God's timing and ours are not always synchronized, but he still shows up. And you and I need to believe that, to embrace it. Because sometime this year, your story, my story, our story is going to reach a critical moment and God will show up. Our government may become even more broken than it already is, if you can imagine that, but God will show up. Terrorists may plot their next atrocity and successfully pull it off, but God will show up. A doctor may bring you a devastating diagnosis, but God will show up. Your marriage could be on the verge of disillusion, but God will show up. Relationships may dissolve, but God will show up. Like so many characters we read about in the Bible, we may find ourselves crushed under the rubble of our own failure, but God will show up. You or I may feel the, an, an unimaginable end pressing its unbearable weight down on us. We may feel abandoned, forgotten, hopeless, lost, but then look who shows up. Looking back on how far we have come, 
we can see the places where God showed up. And because he was faithful then for Abraham, for Isaac, for Jacob, for Joseph, for Moses, for Jesus, because he was faithful then, he will be faithful next. Let's stand. Let's sing. Let's be as faithful as our God. Standing on this mountaintop, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, Yes, our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone, never once did you leave us on our own, you are faithful, God, you are faithful, kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us scars and struggles on the way but with joy our hearts can say yes our hearts can say never once did we ever walk alone never once did you leave us on our own you are faithful God, you are faithful, you are faithful, God, you are faithful. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone. Carried by your constant grace, held within your perfect peace, never once. Do we ever walk alone? Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Every step we are breathing in your grace. Evermore. We'll be breathing out your praise. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were. Close in prayer. Father, in this moment of worship, we submit ourselves to you. And Father, we, we humbly ask that uh, you will go with us uh, from this place, that we will continue in worship in all that we do and all that we say. And Father, we stand as witnesses that you indeed are faithful, that you are there when we need us, you are there in times of joy, times of celebration, times of struggle, suffering, fear. God, just help us to, to draw near to you. Allow us to be filled with your spirit and, and listen for your voice. To listen for your voice and to respond to your calling. Thank you for your immense love. Thank you for your goodness and forgiving yourself and your son, Jesus. And it's through him we pray. Amen.